Hello and welcome to Gravitas London Edition. I am Molly Gambhir and I am coming to you live from the iconic Tower Bridge that's right behind me. Built in 1894, it is one of London's most defining landmarks. It's famous for its striking design. And right now, this spot is buzzing with activity. So is the City of London. After all, it is gearing up to host an event which is taking place after 70 years. The King's Coronation Ceremony, which is slated for the 6th of May. All through this week, we are getting you ground reports from the City of Dreams. We are on our toes, bringing you all the updates, all the aspects of the ceremony in the run-up to the big day. We will continue to report from some of the most iconic places in this city. And we will continue showing you how London is gearing up for the coronation. Today, we are showing you how the city's residents, the Londoners, are preparing for the big day. What's going on on the ground? We have ground reports from the Carnaby Street, the Oxford Street, which are buzzing shopping districts. You will see how these spots are decked up for the coronation already. We also managed to bring to you glimpses of the dress rehearsals that are underway at the Buckingham Palace. And in stark contrast, by the way, the anti-monarchy protests that are flaring up across the city. It's going to be an action-packed bulletin, so stay tuned right till the end. You are watching Gravitas London Edition, and I am Molly Gampir. Also on the show for you tonight, is Finland becoming a new front in the Russia-Ukraine war? Reports say America is in talks with Helsinki to station its troops and military equipment in Finland. And this comes less than a month after Finland was welcomed into the NATO. What does this mean for Russia and the war in Ukraine? We will decode this for you. All is not well with the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. The Labour leader K.S. Starmer saying there is an emerging pattern of behaviour in Sunak's wife's business interests. This is following the revelation that hundreds of thousands in taxpayers' money was pumped into a company that Sunak's wife, Akshita Murthy, invested in. India is building the world's highest railway bridge in Kashmir. And guess what? The bridge is taller than the Big Ben here in London or the Eiffel Tower of Paris. We will tell you all about it on the show tonight. And finally, whether or not you are following the Indian Premier League, I am sure you would not have missed the face-off between the former Indian skipper Virat Kohli and cricketer-turned-politician Gautam Gambhir. The question that we are asking tonight is, when it comes to sports, where and how do you draw the line between passion and sportsmanship? <laughs> become a new front in the Ukraine-Russia war? I'm asking this, keeping in mind the recent developments being talked about quite a bit here in London. I'm talking about a bilateral agreement, one that Finland and the US are negotiating. And this bilateral agreement allows America to use Finnish military bases. And this is according to a report by Helsingin Sanomat. It says that the agreement that is being chalked out allows American troops to station equipment in Finland. Also allowing America to build infrastructure in Finland and establish military bases in Finland. Why is this important? Let me show you. Let's just have a look at this map. Look at where Finland is located. It shares a 1,340 kilometer long border with Russia, the country that is currently fighting a war with Ukraine. Now that is just for the context. While the finer details of this agreement are not out as of now, neither is the timeline for when the American equipment will be arriving in Finland, one cannot help but ask whether Finland will become a new front in this war. You see, this is not the first time that America will be stationing its military or military equipment in another country. 
In fact, far from it. The U.S. has similar agreements with other NATO countries as well. With Norway, for example, where it has invested $170 million into an airport near Oslo. Finland became a NATO member less than a month ago. And I don't know how many of you remember this, but it was Russia's invasion of Ukraine that prompted Finland to join the NATO. 80% of the country's people voted in its favor, by the way. And now this agreement with America is being chalked out as the war in Ukraine continues. How does Russia see this is the immediate question. Before it invaded Ukraine, Russia repeatedly complained about NATO's expansion. In fact, it was one of the many pretexts of this invasion. When Finland was roped into the NATO, U.S. President Joe Biden told the entire world that Europe is more united than ever. Why don't I read out that quote for you right now? When Putin launched his brutal war of aggression against the people of Ukraine, he thought he could divide Europe and the NATO. He was wrong. Today, we are more united than ever. You see, access to Finnish territory has helped the NATO in more ways than one. First, it helps the NATO dominate the Baltic Sea. Second, it provides a new route for reinforcement via Estonia. Basically, Finland helps the NATO strengthen its forward defense. And what's more, the Finnish military is considered to be extremely capable. In fact, analysts say, unlike most European countries, Finland never really stopped preparing for a potential war. Basically, Finland ticks all the right boxes for the NATO. And the news of the bilateral agreement between Finland and the U.S. coming at a time when Russia has unleashed a fresh missile attack on Ukraine. Russian missiles hit Kiev and Pavlorat, killing two people and injuring several others. In Bakhmut, the battle appears to be turning. It's a crucial point. Ukraine claiming Russian forces are being pushed back in Bakhmut. In fact, the commander of Ukraine's ground forces Colonel General Alexander Sirsky saying, and I'm quoting, the situation in Bakhmut is quite difficult. In certain parts of the city, the enemy was counter-attacked by our units and left some positions. In short, the back and forth in Bakhmut continues. And whether or not Finland becomes the next front in the war, here is a question neither of the sides can choose to ignore. Can either Ukraine or Russia afford to drag the war? U.S. estimates saying that Russia has lost 20,000 troops in the last five months. Let me just repeat that for you. 20,000 troops in five months. And half of these were Wagner mercenaries. Now, you may take these numbers with a pinch of salt, given that these are Western estimates. But even then, the high casualty in this war remains a fact. And here's what else does. Ukraine also cannot afford another offensive. I know we have been saying this on Gravitas, and now even Ukraine's Western friends are saying the same thing. The West is concerned that Ukraine's army is not prepared for a counter-offensive. And this despite the Western aid. Russia Sputnik is reporting this, citing a British news outlet. It says, and I'm quoting, the news outlet also cited one of Pentagon's leaked defense documents as arguing that Ukraine might fail to amass sufficient troops and weaponry and fall well short of its goals for regaining territory, unquote. So you have massive casualties and lack of insufficient resources. Which brings us back to the question, can either of the sides afford to drag on this war? The answer may be no, and there are clear signs of war wariness, and it leaves the warring sides with only one solution, and that is peace. Interestingly enough, Pope Francis has said that the Vatican is part of the peace process to end the war in Ukraine. And what is this peace process? What are its terms and conditions? What exactly is on the table and what's not? This is what Pope Francis has to say. The mission is in the course now, but it is not yet public. And when it is public, I will reveal it. 
Here in the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has some questions to answer, yet again over his wife's finances. In fact, Labour leader K.S. Tamer's statement has sent alarm bells ringing. What is this all about? What exactly did Akshita Murthy do this time? Let me just break it down for you over the next few minutes. But before that, let's just have a look at what this statement really is all about. Labour leader Kier Starmer is saying, and I'm quoting, I think there are questions to answer in relation to this. There seems to be an emerging pattern of behaviour here. So I think the sooner those questions are answered, the better. Now, where exactly is this coming from? What's going on? As it turns out, a company partially owned by Rishi Sunak's wife has received taxpayer cash. And it was no ordinary amount, by the way. Murthy runs an investment company named Katamaran Ventures Limited. Katamaran, in turn, holds around 2,500 shares in a startup called Study Hall. And the startup was founded by Sophia Fenichel. It is developing an adaptive learning platform for students. Interestingly, in 2022, Study Hall received around $437,000 in government grant. It covers the period between August 2022 and August 2023. This, by the way, means the bid was made before Sunak became the premier, but likely when he was the chancellor. You see, the startup had Akshita Murthy's interest and suddenly it was blessed with government funds. I hope you realize it is the taxpayer's money we are talking about here. Downing Street Insider saying that the decision was external to the government. A funding panel made the final ruling and not the ministers. But can we really rule out foul play here? Who knows if a few strings were pulled, a few backs were scratched. Those are the questions that are being raised because there is a pattern here. First, it was Murthy's non-domicile status. She saved millions of dollars, remember, on her tax bill as per reports, all the while when cost of living was soaring in the UK and people were struggling here to make ends meet. And then her stakes in childcare agency Koru Kids came under the microscope. We have reported on this before as well. Sunak's wife owns shares in a childcare agency, Koru Kids, and she became a shareholder. This was on the 6th of March. And only nine days later, on the 15th of March, the spring budget was unveiled. New child care policies were introduced. New child minders were given an incentive of $746. But this incentive doubled under one condition. Child care workers who joined through an agency would receive nearly $1,500. And as of now, six agencies are involved in this scheme. And guess what? Murthy's Koru Kids is one of them. Jeremy Hunt has given taxpayers money to Murthy's company. Former health secretary Matt Hancock also has a stake in Koru Kids. Is Akshita Murthy using her husband's position for personal profits is the immediate question. Because simply put, it's highly likely that Sunak family will benefit from the new policy. But did Sunak admit to this when he was grilled by the MPs? He did not. In fact, he firmly said he had no other interests. And now embroiled in a parliamentary probe, and as if that wasn't enough, here's another company with links to Murthy, receiving public cash. This pattern has not evaded the MPs or even the public eye. Starmer is saying Sunak has some questions to answer. And what exactly are these questions? Well, to begin with, are Sunak's public duties coinciding with his private interests? And what explains Murthy's company getting government grants? And why was Sunak reluctant to declare his wife's stakes in Koru Kids? Is it all just a coincidence? Or is there something more to this? And how exactly do the Britons feel about it? As you know, it is the coronation week. Rishi Sunak and wife Akshita Murthy will be leading the procession of flag bearers at King Charles's coronation. In fact, Sunak will also read out Bible verse. 
How will it board with Britons amid all the controversies? On Monday, Joe Biden held an Eid celebration at the White House. And in his speech, he thanked the Muslim Americans for their contribution to the country. This event was meant to celebrate diversity, you know, to make everyone feel welcomed, to make the minority feel included. That was the entire point of it. But did that really happen? A Muslim mayor was barred from entering the White House. You heard that right. On what grounds? Well, it's not known because the Secret Service refused to explain. Our next report getting you the complete story. The White House held a reception on Monday. What was the occasion to mark the end of the holy month of Ramadan? The White House was belatedly celebrating Eid al-Fitr. Several dignitaries were invited. Several Muslim Americans attended the celebrations. U.S. President Joe Biden lauded Muslims for their indispensable contributions to America. At one point, he even quoted the Holy Quran, even condemned targeted violence and Islamophobia. But what happened behind the scenes tells a different story. New Jersey Mayor Mohammad Khairullah was set to arrive at the White House for the celebrations. But all of a sudden, he was disinvited. Why? Apparently, he hadn't been cleared for an entry into the White House. By whom? The Secret Service. When asked why, the Secret Service officials declined to detail. Can you see the irony here? On one hand, America is celebrating diversity, but it is also, on the other hand, denying a Muslim mayor entry into the very same celebrations. Why did this happen? Because of false profiling. When Mayor Khairullah relayed the incident to American Islamic Relations Council, he was informed that there has been a misunderstanding. A person with his name and birth date was in a terrorist screening data set. The data is handled by the FBI. How did Khairullah feel about this? He was obviously disappointed. Here's what the mayor said. It left me baffled, shocked and disappointed. It's not a matter of I didn't get to go to a party. It's why I did not go. And it's a list that has targeted me because of my identity. And I don't think the highest office in the United States should be down with such profiling. Unfortunately, this wasn't the first time the mayor had faced such discrimination. In 2019, Khairullah was returning to the US after visiting his family in Turkey. He was interrogated at New York's John F. Kennedy International Airport for three hours. He was questioned whether he knew any terrorists. In another incident, he was briefly held at the US-Canada border, again for no fault of his. Khairullah was elected to his first term as the mayor of New Jersey in 2001. He has been New Jersey's longest-serving mayor and he has been an American citizen since the year 2000. Khairullah is a high-profile and well-respected American Muslim figure. And if someone like him is being treated like this, one can only imagine how America treats those without the same privilege as a mayor. Bureau report, we on World is One. Since the Russia-Ukraine war started, any country with trade ties with Moscow, any trade ties, was accused of standing on the wrong side of history by Europe. And now, as the war continues, Europe struggles to meet with its domestic oil demands. So what does it do to fix its domestic crisis? Well, it decides to reroute Russian oil, the very same Russian oil it preached the world about. Our next report telling you more. Remember the times when Europe banned imports of certain Russian goods? Remember when Europe expected the world to follow suit? When it decided to lecture India for importing Russian oil? It hasn't been that long, has it? As the war in Ukraine rages on, the global order is changing. Supply chains are in a distorted shape. Trade is becoming expensive and global dynamics are suffering. Europe is facing an internal crisis. It is struggling to meet its domestic oil requirements. This is because nearly 5.6 million BPD or barrels per day of crude oil is produced in Russia. 
It accounts for 13% of global production. But Europe has banned diesel and oil products from Russia. And as a result of this, a major chunk of its oil imports are stalled. So what does it do next? How does it fix the crisis? It imports Russian oil from India. It basically reroutes its oil trade. You see, most of the oil that comes into India is from Russia. India refines that oil. India has 23 refineries. Together, they can refine up to 249.36 million tons of oil per annum. Now, Europe is tapping into this very oil. Soon, Europe is expected to import nearly 360,000 barrels of oil a day from India. So much so that India has become Europe's largest supplier of refined oil. Earlier, this spot was held by Saudi Arabia. But the country's oil exports have decreased by 11.7%. Why just Europe? The United States too has increased certain imports from India. Vacuum gas oil, for example. In 2022-2023, India sent about 11,000 to 12,000 barrels per day of vacuum gas oil shipment to the United States. In 2021-2022, to the number was around 500 barrels per day. Western hypocrisy much? What else will you call it? Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Our next story is on the Indian Premier League. A recent spat between two of Indian cricket's stalwarts has made news. In a match between Bangalore and Lucknow, Virat Kohli and Gautam Gambhir got caught in an argument. Both the stars have been penalized for what transpired. What exactly happened between the two, you are wondering? And where does one draw the line between passion and sportsmanship? Indian Premier League. This is uh, the most popular franchise cricket tournament in the world. It fell witness to the most brutal spat between two high-profile figures. Although this could be a source of entertainment for some, fights can degrade the reputation of the sport and the players as well. So what took place on the cricket ground? Tempers initially flared up between Kohli and bowler Naveen Ulhaq. Both had a verbal argument after the 16th over. And this was more than just friendly banter, by the way. The empires had to step in and separate the two players. The argument continued even after Bangalore won the match. Kohli and Ulhaq clashed again during the post-match handshakes. And eventually, Lucknow team mentor Gautam Gambhir decided to have a talk with Virat Kohli. But that chat between the two did not end well. The fight between Kohli and Gambhir was then broken up by other players. In fact, the Indian cricket board has taken strict action against the duo. Both have been fined with 100% of their match fees. Naveen ul -Haq has also attracted a fine of 50% of the match fees. The altercation has also spilled into social media, onto social media platforms. Pictures are doing the rounds where Kohli is seen silencing the crowd and critics are calling this a sign of arrogance after Bangalore won the match. Pictures of Kohli showing the sole of his shoe are also trending. And this seems to be a move to insult Naveen ul -Haq. And let's just remind you here, these pictures are of a sportsman the world looks up to. So does the penalty really matter to these uh, sportsmen? Will it stop them from fighting in the future? Because history tells us otherwise. In 2013, the duo had a war of words on the field. A verbal clash after the match had ended. Both were again separated by other players. In 2016, Gambhir's aggressive side was on full display when he threw a ball at Kohli in a fit of rage. Virat Kohli is infamous for his aggression on the field. And the top player has been involved in misconduct, like uh, flicking the middle finger at the crowd, exchanging deadly stares, curse words, and almost crashing into physical altercations. 
We are talking about the most famous and influential players here. Some of the most famous ones. Players who are aspiring, who aspiring cricketers look up to. Is this where the sport is heading? A ground where sportsmen argue, spit out curses, while hundreds and thousands of people watch? They disrespect the fellow players, while many children watch. The same children who say that they want to be cricketers when they grow up. Would cricket witness more such fights? Will sportsmen fail to practice sportsmanship? These are the questions that are being asked. India is home to the world's longest station platform. Also, the world's highest motorable pass. And very soon, India will also be home to the world's highest railway bridge. As I speak, in fact, this bridge is under construction in Kashmir. Our next report telling you more. This is Kashmir, home to the world's highest railway bridge. Located on the Chinab River of Kashmir, this bridge is 1,315 meters long. It is part of a broader project by the Indian Railways called the Udhampur Srinagar Baramul Rail Link, which aims to make the Kashmir Valley more accessible. This bridge is an engineering marvel, to say the least. The structure uses 28,000 metric tons of steel fabrication. It is taller than the Eiffel Tower and it is built on an area that can accommodate half a football ground. Also, let's not forget, Kashmir is 1,850 meters above sea level, which is around about 6,070 feet. These numbers explain the challenging location of this bridge and stunning craftsmanship that must have gone into making it. In the past, Kashmir has struggled with connectivity issues given its high altitude location and the Chenab Bridge comes as a big respite, both in connecting the state to the rest of India and in opening the door to tourism revenue. The most distinguishing feature of this bridge is that it is stable enough to withstand an earthquake to the extent of 8 on the Richter scale and it's expected to have a lifespan of 120 years. Authorities say the natural flow of the Chenab River was not disturbed during the construction of the bridge. Not just the world's highest railway bridge, Kashmir will soon also be home to four new railway terminals which will be constructed between Baramula and Banihal. This in turn will make sure that locals in the area have easy access to the market. The Chinab Bridge isn't the first Indian marvel that has caught global headlines. India is home to the world's longest station platform. It's called Hubli Junction and it's located at a height of 1,507 meters. It doesn't stop here. India is also home to the world's highest motorable pass. It's in Ladakh and it is located at a height of over 19,300 feet. Remember the NHS clap? In the year 2020, when the Wuhan virus pandemic hit us, Britain clapped for its health workers. In fact, it lauded the nurses working with the NHS. The country's then Prime Minister called them extraordinary. His government celebrated them as heroes. But when it came to paying them, Britain chose to give them a negligible hike eventually leading to NHS workers walking out. It's been two years, the government has changed, there is a new prime minister, but the NHS staff is still staging walkouts. The last one being on the 1st of May, just the day after we landed here. Nurses across the country in almost half of England's hospitals were on strike. And we decided to witness the protests firsthand just to try to understand what their demands are all about. We visited Trafalgar Square where one such protest was underway. We also spoke to a doctor working with the NHS. Here's 
a detailed report. It is one of the largest employers in the world. With over 1.2 million workers across the UK, it leads the world in terms of equity of access and ensuring no financial hardship for the ill. But can the NHS say the same for its staff? Look at these images. They are from the 1st of May. These are NHS nurses and workers protesting against poor wages, seeking a pay hike from the government. We decided to visit Trafalgar Square to witness one such demonstration. And here we met Dr. Veer Pushpa Gupta, a doctor and researcher with the NHS, also a member of the Royal Society of Medicine. We asked him about the sentiment within the NHS and here's what he told us. Doctors that are striking are junior doctors, uh, so basically consultant level and below, uh, which uh, form a majority of the workforce when it comes to uh, hospitals and hospital staff. Uh, the nurses are striking as well, uh, who form a majority of the workforce not only in the hospitals but also in the community. So it is the backbone of the NHS that is striking at this point. Um, the sentiment is rather uh, desperate in terms of um, how they want to be looked at. So if, if during Corona, there was a lot of respect for doctors and nurses, people came out and clapped, people came out and showed their respect, uh, and it was really um, well received by the NHS. Uh, but as soon as that finished, uh, a lot of the staff feels like they were ignored at that point. Um, uh, obviously, the striking is about increasing salaries, which remain shockingly low for a Western world nation. So what exactly are the NHS workers demanding? Two simple things. One, a 5% pay rise above inflation. And two, better working conditions for the staff. So why is the government refusing to accept these demands? Here's what we were told. I think budgeting concerns have been uh, a, an issue in not only the NHS, but a lot of departments in uh, the civil services in England and in, in Scotland and in Wales and all the home nations. I think that the government the budget of the NHS is actually shockingly high. It's 280 billion pounds, which is more than a lot of countries' GDP. So um, they do have a substantial budget. If the government were to pay uh, and, and pay the money that the doctors and the nurses are demanding, it will only cost them 1 billion a year out of that 280 billion. The government's refusal to accept their demands is proving to be catastrophic. In April, 196,000 hospital appointments had to be cancelled because of the strike. In March, the strike disrupted over 175,000 appointments and procedures. And what does that tell you? That the NHS is nothing without its staff. It truly is the lifeline of the UK's health system. It has developed the status of national treasure. By treating thousands of Britons free of cost, that too over 106 years. And never in its history has the NHS witnessed industrial action on such a scale. The, the number of protesters could increase if their demands are not met. So what is the British government planning to do? Well, last we checked, it had refused to discuss raising salaries, further raising the prospects of more strife. Bureau report, we on World is One. People are celebrating the British royals, but the coronation ceremony is also attracting tension. Anti-monarchy groups are raising their voice against the royals. The famous Trafalgar Square has been bustling with protesters, demonstrating against different issues. In fact, we witnessed some of these protests. What arguments are they putting up? And would these mass scale protests concern the royals? What are they all about? Our next report telling you all that you need to know. A much needed tradition or an outdated royal ritual. The coronation ceremony excites many in the UK. But this time it has ignited mixed emotions. Why? Because Britain is reeling under a cost of living crisis. People are starving due to skyrocketing prices. Citizens are unable to pay high-cost energy bills. And a large chunk of workers surviving without a pay. So ever since King Charles III has taken the helm of the British monarchy, 
protests have often broken out on the streets of London. A host of famous sites across the city witnessing small uprisings. This is Trafalgar Square. Mass groups are gathering here every week. Voices are being raised, various flags are being waved, and demonstrations are taking place against the monarchy. We decided to talk to people and understand what they think about it. It feels crazy. There's also the teachers have also been striking, the train strikes, even like the cleaners, which most of them are Latin Americans and I am from a Latin American community. It feels again like so outrageous to feel that the country has money to spend in something that is so, I don't know, so outdated. Like what, what is that given to the people? Um, and I understand that, that there's one of the arguments is that it involves, it brings tourism. Tourism is not going to solve anything. While talking to demonstrators and protesters, we understood one major cause of anger among the people, the funding of the royal ceremony. The coronation ceremony is being financed from the public purse. This means taxpayers are paying for the ceremony. The same taxpayers who are struggling amid an economic crisis. I'm not from here and I, I feel like the hate that I might be getting after saying that I don't really understand why monarchy still exists and the amount of money that goes into that when there are so many people that don't have what to eat or there are people that have no shelter. So it feels like a slap in the face of so many people and the entire population of this country. So it's actually shameful. Trafalgar Square has become a hub for critics of the royal event. Why do people choose the bustling square for protests? Well, it is named after Britain's victory in a battle. The victory shattered Napoleon, a dictator's plan to invade England. If we see it this way, the protests also seem to be a battle between royals and the common people. I'm standing right now at London's iconic Trafalgar Square, one of the major hubs of central London, named after the Battle of Trafalgar between the, the British Royal Navy and the combined fleets of the French and Spanish navies. It is a very prominent site which witnesses celebrations, events, even protests. And today is no different. The tradition is outdated. We are not interested in the event. These were the answers we got when we asked people about the coronation ceremony. What could be the reason? On the whole, I think like like a lot of young people, I'm not super like into the monarchy. Like I've lived here my whole life, but I'm not. I don't think it's as big a deal for young people as it is for kind of older people. So I would never go and watch it just because of the crowds and stuff. So. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I didn't even realize that it was going to be next weekend until today. <laughs> Studies show that support for the royals has fallen to the lowest since 1983. The National Center for Social Research saying a total of 45% people said they did not support the monarchy. In 2022, 35% people said that they were not interested in the royals. This is a significant drop in the support for the royal family. I think it's just a kind of like outdated I guess with this whole thing with like Meghan Markle and Harry I feel like they had a bit of an opportunity like a window where they could modernize and the face of the monarchy could change but I feel like it just went the wrong way and things like became very weird and everyone was like kind of looking at you know Charles he's not super popular especially with the crown and stuff and then a lot of people liked like younger people liked Meghan and Harry and thought they were modern. There are more protests being planned for Coronation Day, the 6th of May. An anti-monarchy group, the Republic, is organizing rallies all over England and Scotland. The demonstrations are aimed at the main agenda and aim to replace the king as the head of state by an elected official. Republic has upheld its agenda and says that an elected head of state will represent the people's hopes and this will help keep politicians in check. We will be tracking the coronation celebrations and the protests as we move closer to the ceremony day. No matter what unfolds on the coronation day, 
Britain is surely in for a grand show. So you've seen the protests and you've seen the strikes, but it's not all gloom and doom here. Yes, there are demonstrations, but there are also celebrations. Flags and royal emblems adorning the streets. The shops are awash with decorations. In fact, with dress rehearsals underway at Buckingham Palace. In the last 24 hours, we have traveled to some of the most iconic places in the city to get you a glimpse of how London is gearing up for the coronation. Here's a report on what we saw. Pipers greeting tourists at Westminster Abbey. Street parties in honor of the king at Trafalgar Square. Union Jack flags adorning the iconic Oxford Street. Coronation themed events at the famous Carnaby Street and the Royal Guard rehearsing vigorously at Buckingham Palace. This is how London is preparing for the coronation of King Charles III. The city has sprung to life. Royal emblems are adorning the streets as excited tourists capture it all on their cell phones. We decided to witness the preparations firsthand with stopovers at all these iconic spots. So we're now taking you on a journey through London on board the iconic tube. We're right now boarding uh, the tube from the Westminster Station. Come along with us. Our first stop was Oxford Street, one of Europe's busiest shopping streets. It was draped with Union Jack flags to mark the historic occasion. The decorations are not just on the streets, but also inside the stores. This is the Oxford Street in London, one of Europe's busiest shopping streets. It has over 300 shops and welcomes more than 200 million visitors a year. And it already has a banner informing the visitors about the coronation ceremony slated for the 6th of May. From Oxford Street, we headed to Carnaby, one of London's most popular shopping districts. It had colourful installations all around, lights with national colours, a crown suspended above the street, and a welcome note marking the coronation. I'm at the famous Carnaby Street right now, an avenue that's always in style. Located in Westminster, it has been the home of popular fashion for decades. It first became known as a retail location in the 19th century when the Carnaby Market first appeared. And today, it has the reputation of being a fashion mecca. The next day, we travelled to Buckingham Palace to witness the dress rehearsals. The atmosphere was invigorating to say the least. And we then left for Trafalgar, another iconic tourist spot. In the afternoon, it was stormed by the protesters. But as evening descended, there were dance parties, with people breaking a leg to some spectacular Afro music. With four days left for the coronation, London has truly come to life. The festivities have just started. In the days ahead, they are expected to engulf the entire city. This is Molly Gambhir reporting from London for We On World Is One. Let's now tell you what else made news around the world. Time for Gravitas Global Headlines. Canadian police fire tear gas at protesters in the capital of Nairobi as the opposition resumes anti-government demonstrations following a one-month pause. Portuguese police operation leads to major drug bust. Police find 4.2 tons of cocaine hidden in a shipment of bananas from Colombia entered Portugal through a port city. Uganda's parliament passes new draft of anti-LGBTQ bill. 
Provisions retained in new bill include the death penalty for aggravated homosexuality and a 20-year sentence for promoting homosexuality. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says the international community is worried about the stability of Afghanistan. The warning cites issues including terrorism, a lack of inclusivity of women and girls and the spread of drug trafficking. Denmark Defence Ministry announces it will send a NATO battalion to Latvia next year to help support the Baltic state following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Pakistan's year-on-year -year inflation hit its highest ever level of 36.42% in April after the government introduced new taxes and raised fuel prices to try to meet IMF conditions for key bailout. A multi-continental crackdown has halted a major dark web marketplace with international police arresting 288 suspects and recovering more than $54.8 million in cash and virtual currency. Mobile phone giant Apple fights a $2 billion lawsuit in the United Kingdom accusing the company of concealing issues with batteries in certain phone models and installing software that limited phone performance. Second seed Daniel Medvedev has crashed out of the Madrid Masters in the round of 16. The 2021 US Open champion lost to Arslan Karatsev in straight sets. Monte Carlo Masters champion Andre Rublev was also knocked out. The fifth seed fell to fellow Russian Karen Kachanov. James Harden rolled back the years with a 45-point display to guide the Philadelphia 76ers past the Boston Celtics in Game 1 of the Eastern Conference semifinals. Harden scored a clutch three-pointer with less than 10 seconds left to help the visitors seal a 119-115 to point triumph in Boston. And with that, it's a wrap on tonight's Gravitas London edition. We are coming to you live from London all through the week in the run-up to the Coronation Day. So stay tuned to Be On World is One. For now, we are wrapping this edition and leaving you, as always, with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching. Guys, nice and tight. Everybody down here, please. Nice and Hold on, they're fixing it again.